All right. Uh, so that was Theodore Edgecombe uh, on the stand during his trial. And joining us this hour is Eric Newmark. He is a an attorney in Minnesota who is also licensed to practice in Wisconsin and has been uh, for many, many, many years. So, Eric, uh, thanks for joining us on this uh, third hour of For the Record. And Catherine Lazardo is with us as well. Uh, Eric, I'll start with you. Uh, what did you make of the outcome of this case and Theodore Edgecombe's testimony? Well, first of all, thanks for the many, many, many years. It makes me seem a little older than I'd like to be. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah, I no, I'm very yeah, no, no, no. and wise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, well, my, my initial reaction is, is that uh, the defense attorneys must have really cringed, um, and I, I can't imagine they were prepared for what their client said on the witness stand. Generally speaking, when your claim is self-defense, uh, you have to admit to the crime. Um, but that there was a legal justification for what he did. And so when he gets on the witness stand and says it was an accident, it's much harder to uh, assert a self-defense claim because you're saying, I didn't, I didn't do it on purpose. Uh, therefore, it's, it's really hard to argue self-defense. I would, I would think so, for sure. Uh, Catherine, I really think, given the fact that the jury almost kind of appeared to take Theodore Edgecombe at his word, uh, that this was an accident, they found him guilty of that lesser included offense of reckless homicide, that had Theodore Edgecombe maybe said that I shot him because I thought he was going to kill me or I thought I, he was going to really hurt me and he was saying all of this stuff, Maybe he would have been acquitted. I, I don't know what your feeling is on that, but that's my feeling. I have the same feeling, actually, Anjanette, because if they focused on the self-defense and not say that it was an accidental shooting, he didn't intend to, I think there's more coherence with the theory of their defense. But when they included the fact that he accidentally shot him, how can you say they accidentally shot him and then you're claiming self-defense? It's completely contradictory. But looking at the facts, when he, when Edgecombe was supposedly came up to the car and violently punched um, the victim, there was something that happened that uh, I did, that uh, it's not very clear, which is, he said, did you say something to me? Edgecombe said that to uh, the victim, and, and what was it that happened before that? So, you know, he, he could say, I, I'm doing self-defense, I, I was, I shot him in self-defense because when he came out of the car, I wasn't sure if he was going to go after me. I don't know if he had a weapon on him or not. Uh, ironically, both of mm -hmm. them did have some type of weapon and uh, the, the victim had a knife and he had a gun, which is a very unfortunate set of facts here, a very bad facts for all parties. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it, it's just a it was a terrible set of facts, even in some respects for the state. I mean, a man lost his life. But at the same time, you have him, um, you know, he and his wife in this vehicle and then going and following this guy. I, I can understand maybe following him, calling 911, but getting out of the vehicle. Uh, it just seems like nothing good is going to, to come out of that whatsoever. Uh, so let's look now at a little bit of the closing argument from uh, Grant Hubner. He was an assistant district attorney for Milwaukee County, and then we'll discuss it. Defense counsel stated that the, defendant, the state has not met its burden of proof. And then they didn't mention a single element. Not one of the legal requirements you have to take a look at here. Not one of them. We showed and proved that the defendant caused the death of the victim. We showed he did so with intent to kill. And defense counsel stated, oh, well, he's not a cold-blooded killer because why didn't he shoot 17 times? That's not the law. The law is whether or not he shot with intent to kill or practically certain to cause death. He took a gun that he's trained on, that he knows what will happen. He points it at the head of another individual, ladies and gentlemen, and he pulls the trigger and he puts a bullet in the victim's head. He says he's not a killer. He killed someone. That's what this is about. Ladies and gentlemen, Retro Cameron didn't say he was a cold-blooded killer. What he said was what the defendant did was cold-blooded. He didn't mention any time, during any time, about the defendant looking shocked or in looking scared or any of that. Not when he's talking to the police. 
Ladies and gentlemen, when he was talking to the police in that 911 call, what was he doing begging the 911 caller to do? Get here. He's still here. He's still here. You can find him. He's got to go. He just shot him in the head. He was begging the police to find that man, the defendant. Rodrell Cameron wasn't saying, oh my God, that guy looked really scared. You better go try to find him and make sure he's okay. He's saying, find him. I'm a person that just saw a man's head get blown off in front of me, and I want the person who did so found, found and caught. And he couldn't because he ran. And then he ditched the weapon. Uh, saying that this guy is a killer. Uh, so, Eric, I'm wondering uh, what you make of this. Have you, you know, have you ever been in a courtroom with this Grant Hubner before? Um, he seemed pretty good. Uh, I have not. He he did seem pretty good and quite aggressive um, as well. And and I noticed in the argument, mm -hmm. he you know he was really pushing the intentional um, homicide that ultimately the defendant wasn't convicted of. Um, and, and you know, it seemed to me that it, it he may obviously he got the conviction, but he may have adjusted his argument in light of the defense and defendant's testimony and instead of going at, you know, and really focused on, on what the testimony was. And when he was saying, well, I wasn't acting in self-defense, I, I, you know, it, it could have been a little tighter and said, well, you know, it, it clearly was an intentional homicide. It, it, ultimately the jury found him guilty of the, of the reckless, which, you know, carries with it a potential 60 year sentence. Um, but I, you know, I think that both lawyers had a hard time kind of adjusting to what the testimony was. And one of the most important things of being a, a successful, a good trial attorney, which these lawyers both are, yeah. is being able to adjust to the testimony, which oftentimes is not what you expect it to be. And I'm sure both lawyers were surprised at the defendant's testimony. And the defendant didn't do himself any favors when he testified. And I, I think that's the, the key here. And Catherine, I think it's hard and if you're if you're doing a case or you're the defendant charged in a case like this and you're claiming self-defense, you almost certainly have to take the witness stand to explain what was going through your mind and what was happening at the time. And, and it is a little shocking to me that Theodore Edgecombe said what he said on the stand. It is quite shocking and contradictory. Like my colleague mentioned, most likely his lawyers cringed when he said that he accidentally shot uh, Mr. Clareman. Uh, it's either he he was he wasn't prepared well for that, or he didn't listen to his counsel's advice as to where the defense should really be going. What I find very uh, good with Mr. Eubner's uh, uh, closing is that he really honed in on the elements of the case. He took out the distractions that the defense were trying to basically show to the jury. For example, the distraction that oh, why did he not shoot him 17 times, or the distraction about the wife's testimony, Mrs. Clareman, uh, not being too emotional, um, or that uh, the other distraction of there was a knife in his pocket, uh, what was going on there. So he took that all out and just honed in and said, there is this, uh, there is an intent to kill, but the jury didn't buy that part, but found the reckless homicide because they believe that he acted so recklessly that he practically caused uh, certain death to Mr. Clearman. And uh, we, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, Theodore Edgecombe will be sentenced in April. At that time, he faces up to 60 years in prison. And I know I was talking with some people yesterday, uh, or actually, yeah, yesterday, uh, who believe the ju judge would probably throw the book at Theodore Edgecombe just based on how <laughs> he acted toward the defense during the trial. All right, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the very latest on the Kyle Rittenhouse case. You thought it was all over. Well, guess what? It's not. <laughs> Might be now. Uh, but at least uh, there were some other issues discussed uh, in court today, and we'll tell you all about them when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching For the Record on Law and Crime. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network 
to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box.